We'll return to this um, next semester. You might want to go ahead and buy one if you don't have it. But if you don't have that, it's okay. Today you have a little handout that has you filling in, filling in blanks today. And then one of the other things we've been using is our departure journal, which is where we've been making some notes that we want to leave behind. Should we go away for a while? Or maybe should we pass away? We want to leave this for folks to see the most important things in our life, little tidbits of advice, instruction that we'll leave behind. So you also received a three by five card. Everybody's received one of those? That was just to give you. Everybody say thank you. That was, <laughs> just wanted you to have one of those in varieties of color. We'll use that at the end today. So we've got some work to do. Did you come here ready to work today? Yes, but honestly, no. Well, we will anyway, okay? So uh, we're gonna begin with our departure journals like we've been doing. We'll begin and end in our departure journals. So if you would take that out. If you don't have a departure journal, that's okay. Just take out that handout and it has a place for you to write at the very top. And let me give you some instructions. If you would do this with me, you get the most out of today's service, you just uh, humor me here. And we, this entry is going to be entitled, My Belief. So would you make an entry, moms and dads with Shepherds Club kids, at this point you're leaning over, you're helping them find a new blank page, writing today's date at the top, today's passage, John 16. 25 to 33, help them write, okay, what to draw. But departure journals, let's, let's call this one my belief. So maybe, how do you do that? All caps, underline it, draw flowers around it. Guys, what do you usually do? Just write my belief, and let me start this one this way. I'm leaving, but I want you to know that I believe. I talk about my belief in Christ, but I hope I've shown you my belief in Christ. I hope you've seen my belief every time I... Now I want to give you just a moment. List four things. List four things. Every time I've prayed with you every time I've you've seen me control myself every time I've made a decision for my family write a few things out there I hope you've seen my belief every time I I just jot that down every time I give you advice when I give you advice, I'm drawing from my beliefs. Every time I woke you up and brought you to church. Got a few of those things down there, everyone? I'm leaving, but I want you to know that I believe. I hope you've seen my belief every time I... I just jot those down, and we will come back to that. Okay, everyone? Now, let's turn to John chapter 16 together and look at our last departure passage. John 16, and we'll begin in verse 25. Twenty-five to thirty-three. So, not a, not a long passage today. Most of what we're going to do involves the end, verse thirty-three. Those promises there. We begin in verse twenty-five, and let's just recap one last time. Jesus, born in Bethlehem, was raised by godly parents who taught him scripture, lived a sinless life began his public ministry, which lasted about three years, traveled around with a ragtag group of guys, and now knows that the time of his departure has come. Within hours, he will be betrayed. He will suffer 
be humiliated, placed upon the cross to pay the sin debt for our sins, be placed in the grave, and on the third day rise again victorious. And as people have preached that and have believed that now for over 2,000 years, and you all said, amen. Yes, we have. Jesus is about to depart, but here's the thing. He knows that when he leaves, that will throw his beloved friends into confusion. It will be days of darkness, doubt, depression. They've placed all their hopes on Jesus. They've followed him around for three years. They've memorized things that he said, but they don't understand that he needs to die. They don't understand that he, that was the plan from the beginning. They don't understand that. There's nothing in the Gospels that make it clear that any of the apostles completely understood what was about to happen. So Jesus is thinking to himself, I'm going to leave within the hour. What do I need to say to these men? Because I can picture the time that's coming and how it's going to rattle them and how dark it's going to be for them and how are they going to make it without me? How are they going to hold on through the things that are coming because persecution is coming? Very difficult times are coming. What do they need? And then he begins to teach. So we hang on to that. And today he begins in verse 25 of John 16 this way. I'm leaving, but I want you to know soon things will become much more direct. I'm leaving, but I want you to know that soon things will be much more direct. Well, what do you mean by direct? I mean this, I will talk to you more, I will be more direct about the Father. I will be more direct about the Father. I've used figurative language, I've told stories, I've given illustrations, allegories, metaphors, analogies, trying to, to convey truths, but a time is coming very soon when I'm going to be very direct. Here is our sign for direct today, everyone, if you want to do it with me. I'm going to be very direct, okay? I'm going to be very direct. And everybody says, thank you. We need it direct, don't we? Verse 25 together, everyone. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, in the King James, in Proverbs, in figures of speech. Jesus has used figures of speech his entire ministry. He's actually used it during the upper room discourse. He used it in the last passage. And he says, I've spoken this way, and some of you don't like it, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly or directly about the Father. So I won't say, well, he's like this, or you should know, consider this story. I'm going to tell you things direct, straightforward. There's a word. Straightforward. I'm going to be more straightforward about the Father for you. Plain language. No more artistic language. So why did he use figurative language in the first place. And verse 16 is a good example of this. The things that he said, people puzzled over it. And there's a couple of things that we need, just these two things for, for right now, because there's a lot to be said about figurative language. Using figurative language, notice what Jesus was able to do. Let's do the simplest one first. Jesus could take a very complex and difficult subject about the mysteries of God in heaven and turn it into, using artistic language, using figurative language, turn it into something that even a child could understand. That's one of the reasons we use figurative language, right? Here's the other one, and this one's a little more complex. The, Jesus' use of the parables show us this. Jesus could say one parable which is tell a story, put it in figurative language, to a variety of people. They're all here. They're all here. They're all listening to the, the figurative language. And the way he would do it would make it so that if you're here with a hard heart and you don't want to believe, your response is, 
I'm angry and confused. <laughs> but if you're here with a soft heart, you want to believe. You hear it, and your response is, oh, I want more. Isn't that an interesting tool? Teachers in the room, isn't that an interesting tool to use? You students here who don't want to learn, this is for you. You students here who can't wait to learn more, this is for you. Now watch what happens. And he would constantly do this, right? You see this happening over and over again in Jesus' ministry because you got a group of people. Jesus is like, okay, I'm done for the day. Last lesson. A group of people get up. Oh, I can't believe that guy. What on earth was he talking about? I don't know, but I don't like him. I'm against him. And then another group of people that just stay after class. They're like, I don't understand everything you said, but I do understand that I want more of that. Right? great tool that Jesus used. Jesus says, soon I won't be doing that anymore. Soon things are going to become much more direct. Direct. I will be more direct specifically about the Father. I'm going to be more direct about the Father and you will go directly to the Father. And what I mean by go is pray. You will pray directly to the Father. So I will be more direct about the Father, and you will go directly to the Father, because let me explain this theologically. You will be in Christ. He, this is direct language, which he gives us later. Right? He gives us in books like Romans. You will be in Christ, and so you're, God is going to be able to lavish his grace and love directly upon you the way he does upon the Son. Verse 26, in that day you will ask in my name, so you're still doing it in Christ's name, but you're going directly to the Father, and I do not say that I shall pray the Father for you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not praying the Father to the Father for you. Verse 27, for the Father himself loves you. Now, some, somebody already said, that's enough for me today. I'm going to check out now. I'm going to draw pictures because I just heard the Bible say, for the Father himself loves you. And that's what I needed to hear today. He doesn't just put up with you. He doesn't just stand you for the time being as this project. The Father himself loves you. Why? Because you have loved me. How do you feel about the Son? You have loved the son. The father just loves that. I love, I love those kids that love my son. And you have believed. Here's a word in our John notebooks. We're, we always circle the word belief, faith, uh, believed is all the same word in Greek. And have believed that I came forth from God. Now, that's a huge theme in the upper room discourses that we won't go back to now. But it began that way in John chapter 13, verse 1. Jesus knew he came from the Father, and he knew he was going back to the Father, but he's going to go back by way of the cross. That's right, everybody. So now Jesus is saying, the Father himself loves you because you've loved me. And he said a lot about that already too, hasn't he, everyone? You, you want to love the Father. You can't be okay with the Father and not okay with the Son and vice versa. You, but you've loved me, and you've, you've believed that I came forth from God, and God himself loves you, loves you. So you will go directly to the throne of grace with confidence now because of what I'm about to accomplish on the cross. If, if my blood does not cover you, don't presume to enter into the throne room of the king of the universe. Don't, don't think that that's even possible. But if I accomplish my work on the cross and then you receive me and receive the gift of salvation and turn from your sinfulness, if you receive me, then you will be standing positionally in Christ. And in that moment, you can go before the king of the universe because now when he sees you, he sees the glowing righteousness of his son. And he himself loves you. I came forth from the father in verse 28 and I have come I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. And now, are you ready? He's going to be very direct. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. In case you missed what I was trying to say in verse 16, 
Here's what I'm telling you. I leave the world and go to the Father. That's true. But he's going to go to the Father by way of the, one more time, cross. So Jesus is saying, look, I'm leaving, but I want you to know that soon things will be much more direct. I will be more direct about the Father, and you will go directly to the Father. And so when the apostles hear this, they go, oh, now is the time when he's becoming more direct because of what he just said in verse 28. Now is that time, and that's, now is not the time. The time when he's going to be more direct is the time of the spirit of truth. Now, how many of you have already noticed that in the John passages, there are four very strong spirit passages about the coming. Jesus is departing, but the spirit is arriving. And that is why everything is okay. Jesus says, I have a lot to tell you now. In uh, chapter 16, verse 12, I, I've got a lot of things to tell you, but you can't bear them now, but that's okay, because when the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. Jesus was speaking to the apostles. So there's coming, there's coming a time. I don't have to try to dump everything on you right now. The lessons I'm giving you are very, very important, because I won't see you again for a while. But I know that soon, because of what I accomplished on the cross, you will be able to receive salvation, which means receiving the Holy Spirit. And the spirit of truth will come into you, Matthew. Will come into you, Thomas. James, John, the spirit will come into you. And he will begin to help you clarify all the things you know about me. Because you are the eyewitnesses. And you'll write books, right? And the church will be built on the foundation of your eyewitness testimony. Because the spirit himself will help you clarify it. Because he is the spirit of truth. In that day, you're going to notice... That the Spirit is much more direct because he's speaking to a different audience, right, than Jesus was dealing with. Jesus' hearers were, were this group of people who are, some were ready to kill him and the others were ready to receive him and call him Savior. It's a very mixed situation, but now the Spirit's going to come and he's going to speak. He's going to clarify in the apostles' minds. Everybody, is the Spirit involved in Scripture? Is the Spirit involved in the writing of Scripture? Somebody's ready to quote 2 Timothy 3.16, right? Not only is the Spirit involved in the writing of Scripture, the Holy Spirit is involved in the believer's hearing of Scripture, right? Is the Spirit at work in you hearing His Scripture? So He's the one that wrote the book, and then as you hear it and read it, the Spirit is giving a testimony inside of you like a quiet amen. That's all true, by the way. I wrote that. That's all true. More than you know. The Spirit is at work in both of those things, giving illumination. But not only that, everybody, who wrote this book we're reading right now? John chapter 16 was written by a guy named, whoa, there's a tough one, right? Tough Sunday morning question. John was one of the apostles, so tell, help me out with this. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, helped to guide John in the writing of his account of Jesus' life so he could get this right in coordination with, because he already knew Matthew, Mark, and Luke existed. And now you have the gospel story of Jesus told from all these different perspectives, different angles. John writes his, and which book are you studying right now? 2,000 years later, you're using his book that the Holy Spirit guided him, and the Holy Spirit is now still in me right now, in you right now, and the Holy Spirit is helping his people to hear a fresh, continuous message about Christ and the Father. Still today. Isn't that great? People respond to the gospel today. They are continuing to respond to this clarifying work of the Spirit of truth. Aren't you glad that he's direct? And aren't you glad that we can go directly to the Father? How many of you are glad you don't have to pray to your ancestor you don't have to pray to your angel or your saint. You get to go directly into the throne of God's presence and lay a petition before him. And you know how that works, right? Oh, great king, I come to you with my mouth is open because you're so awesome and my knees are knocking because you're kind of terrifying. Oh, great king, I'm worried about this thing. I've I'm not sure what to do about this thing, and I lay it at your feet. I trust you do with it what you want. 
And you know what? I'm going to give you responsibility for it, in fact. I'm going to give you response. You're the king. This is easy for you. You decide what you want to do or don't do anything, whatever. You be responsible for it. And we can go to him, and as a result, I should say, in accompanying to that, you have in your John passages four prayer promises. Everybody remember learning those? The very last one was in verse 23, where Jesus says, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father, you'll go directly to the Father. In my name he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. You see that it's all true as Jesus gives the answers to your prayers. Would you guys read this whole sentence or two with me? I'm leaving, but I want you to know that soon things will be much more direct. I will be more direct about the Father, and you will go directly to the Father in your praying. Now, that's the first part of this passage, and here's the second part. I'm leaving, but I want you to know that soon things will be much more direct, and this goes together, and your belief will be tested in a thousand different ways. Everybody say, oh, joy. <laughs> Thank you for adding that. It's not like you, Jesus, to add fluff to any of your teachings. So we can count on you here. You're not doing that here. Would you guys say this with me? I'm leaving, but I want you to know that soon things will be much more, and your belief will be tested in a thousand different ways. And this is the part, everybody, honestly, is going to take the rest of our time to do a little work here. Uh, one more time with uh, folks that remember their days at camp. You like hand motions. Let's be direct, everybody. Direct. We're thankful for the epistles, for the age of the spirit of truth who gave us the rest of Scripture and told us so much more things about God, about Christ, the gospel, in a very direct way. Here's the second one, my friends. Um, the ASL community, I, if I get this right. What is that one? Anybody know? Belief. Everybody say, belief. I'm adding this part. I think it's just preachers do that. I think it's just preachers that do that. I think I got that right. Uh, belief. Belief. Did you see it already? The word already appear in our passage? You put a circle around it. Your belief, I could use the word trust, I could use your, the word faith, but I'm going to use the word belief today, just do something a little fresh, okay, and this will be our sign for belief. Your belief will be tested in a thousand different ways. Now, hang on with me. I'm going to try to illustrate this in a minute. You're going to really have to bear with me in that, but let's see what the, how the apostles react. Verse 29, his disciples said to him, look, now you're speaking plainly and using no figures of speech. Finally, they've asked him direct questions before. And remember, he always gave them some Mr. Miyagi kind of kung fu -y answers. They were a little mysterious, like Master Yoda. We didn't know exactly what they meant. And now they're saying, but finally, you're speaking directly and plainly. What are they talking about? I think they're referencing the very end, verse 28. I'm leaving the world. I'm going to the Father. Well, thank you. For being much more direct than a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. He's left that behind. He's speaking more direct. So they think this is the time of directness. Well, they're, they're kind of wrong, but listen to them. You're speaking plainly and you're using no figures of speech. And now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. No one needs to follow up questioning about you. By this we... Ooh, I can't hold the Bible and do that at the same time. Seems like there might be something wrong with that. By this, we now believe, okay, that you came forth from God. Remember, coming forth from God, going back to God, this is really important. That means he's the Savior. That means his origin is from antiquity, from eternity with the Father. But now we believe this. So what they're saying is right, right now, because you speak directly, now we believe. And one of the things they're confessing, and let's be nice to them, one of the things they're confessing, that means this is what I believe, I'm confessing this, is 
We believe that you are the supreme revealer of who God is. That's true. And all the people said, and the New Testament bears that up. Christ is the full expression of who God is. He's the embodiment. There isn't a better interpretation of who God is than Jesus. So when you try to unravel the mysteries of who God is, you think of Jesus. When you try to understand who the Holy Spirit is, you think of Jesus. When you, when you, are, when you go to the heavenly country because you've put your trust in Jesus, when you, the heavenly country, you say, I, I want to see God. And you'll be looking in the face of Jesus and you have seen him. I and the Father are one to see me, to see the Father. So the, the, the apostles are confessing, we believe you are the one to tell us what we really need to know about who God is. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And the apostles are correct. And what they have said, they believed. How many of you think, I think maybe I would have believed when he walked on water. Uh, Lazarus was dead for four days, came back to life. I think I would have believed then. I met the, I met the man, I realized he's not like anybody else, and just hanging out with him, I realized, I believe. I listened to the way he talked, and the way he talked was not like how anybody else talks. He talks like somebody who's actually been there, who actually knows what he's talking about. That's when I believed. And somebody, said, somebody else said, the combination of all those, I believe. But here the apostles say, now you're speaking directly. Now we believe. And the, the emphasis is on that now, right now. How many of you believe in Jesus right now? Okay, some of you do. How many of the rest of you, how many of you believe, I don't know, Confucius right now? All right, how many of you believe in Jesus right now? If I were to ask you right now, you say, I believe in Jesus right now. Five minutes from now, tragedy strikes. And it's going to matter then what you believe then. Hang on to that for just a second because Jesus is going to say something that sounds like he's not exactly happy with what they said. Verse 31. So the, the word belief was used in verse 27. You circled it there. It's used in verse 30. You circled it there. Your little John notebooks. Here it is again in verse 31. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Does that sound like a good answer? Do you, do you now believe? It's actually just two words. You now believe, huh? Now you do. I almost put the word finally in there. Maybe. Finally, you believe. But listen to what Jesus says. Indeed, the hour is coming. And you, you know what the word hour means. And it's, it means much more than much more than 60 minutes in the upper room, it means quite a bit, right? The hour is coming, yes, has now come. It's, it's now. Judas is making his way towards the Garden of Gethsemane with soldiers as we speak, right? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. Now, John is writing this from the perspective of somebody who's what? He's not in the moment. What's he doing? He's remembering. So the next line is really important. You'll leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. John, as you remember this, um, Peter, you denied me three times, cussing at that guy. I was never alone. So stop beating yourselves up for a while. You guys all ran. Every single one of you stopped beating yourselves up. You left me alone because you lost your minds in the middle of tribulation. But I was not alone. Okay, so calm down. I was never alone. Because the Father's with me. And then he gives this, everybody. Listen to all the promises in verse 33. I highlight this verse. This is just a powerful, fantastic verse. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace, shalom. In the world you will have, 
suffering, trouble, and tribulation, pick the nicest one of those words. I don't know. <laughs> there isn't one. Tribulation. We'll use tribulation. But be of good cheer, which another translation of that is be courageous. Be courageous because I have overcome the world. Or another translation, I have conquered the world. So listen to all of what's going on in this, this, this one verse. Now you believe, huh? Okay. Well, in a few seconds, you're about to be hit by 1,000 different tribulations all at the same time in the darkest hour of your life, and you'll be scattered and run from me. But peace. <laughs> Listen to what he's saying. I've told you all this ahead of time so that spirit of truth comes. You're going to reflect back on this. John, you're even going to write it down. And as you think about it and think about what I've taught you, you're going to have peace. My peace, because by the way, the world doesn't have any peace to give. Far from it. The world has no peace to give, just trouble, more trouble. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Take courage, because I've overcome the world. In what, in what sense had Jesus overcome the world? Oh, we could say several things, but at least let's say these two things. Number one, Jesus conquered the evil of this world, and all the people said, Yes, the snake is still writhing. Yes, he's still dangerous, but he's mortally wounded now and dying. The old world is now still here, but it is going out. And a new world is coming on as we speak. Jesus reigns in the hearts and lives of people who are receiving him, and his kingdom is expanding every day. It doesn't matter what the governments of the world say. The church grows and grows even more by the blood of the martyrs and the light of Christ is shining in more and more hearts and the world is, people are being transformed. And so he has conquered the evil. He's conquered the evil one of this world, the ruler of this world. And one sense, that's one sense in which he's overcome the world. Here's the second one. Jesus has overcome the world system. And the world system is this. I know you, you think I'm about to say something about the Antichrist. No, something much more important. The world system is this organizational system, if you want to call it that. Ready? Sinfulness, 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 death. That's the world system we're born into. Drop, drop you into it at any point, and here's what you have. A world system that moves everything from sinfulness, 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 to ultimately that sinfulness killing you, leading to death. That's the world system. Jesus has conquered that. For the very first time, that has been upset, right? This is for people who believe that Jesus has conquered the world system, conquered evil. For these people, they can find a sense of peace. So you have the promise of tribulations, you're not going to be drawn out of them. There's no hiding from them. There is no place to run. If there were, I promise you I'd be there. There is no place to run from the troubles of this world. But in the midst of the troubles, if you believe that Jesus has overcome the world, that belief will impact your attitude of peace, your attitude of worry, anxiety, fear. Isn't that where we started, everybody? Okay. All right. So now... I need you to bear with me. First, let's read this together. I'm leaving, but I want you to know that soon things will be much more, and your belief will be tested in a thousand different ways. So cool that you believe right now, but it's kind of important that you believe when the... You guys are getting it. It's great that you believe right now. We're all standing together. I've been teaching, 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 teaching. Miracle, miracle, miracle. And they say, hey, we believe now. Now trouble's coming. That's when you're really going to need to, everybody follow that. You should put that in your own words. I'm not sure how to put that in your own shorthand or whatever. Okay, here's my illustration about the tail of the two jackets. Okay, this, this week in your small group, small group leaders are going to find a way for you guys to come up with a different illustration. Share that with us. Uh, 
I don't know how old this jacket is. How many of you dads have clothes you're not sure how old they are? Uh, let's just say years, right? This was given to me at Christmas. This is a high quality, I uh, have a Jan Sport. I don't know, Liberty makes them. Um, I got this jacket from, I think, my parents. And, uh, you know, for a while you take good care of it. Well, it's new, right? Then you start wearing it all the time. You, there's some oil stain right there. This group over here say, amen, I can see that oil stain, right? And then there's these great little holes. It has these tiny, there's one. There's great little tiny holes in it. Anybody knows what those holes are from? From the fire pit. Hey, how many fire pit holes do you see in this jacket? Right? I like this jacket. Herringbone, tweed, made of wool. Kind of fits me decently. I only can get it out in the winter time, fall time, right? Ask me which jacket I like better. I like this jacket better. Which jacket do you think I use the most? You know, we, uh, we focus on some of us especially um, obsess over having this one perfect thing, right? Like, I want the best whatever it is, Right? We focus on, I got, this, I got this jacket right here, which I uh, like this jacket. It's one of my favorite jackets. Most of the time, it's hanging in my closet. Yeah, right? So it only comes, out, only comes out certain times. This jacket, if it's just, you know, you guys know the right temperature for a, for a hoodie jacket. It's, it's, quite, it's got a, quite a range, doesn't it? This jacket comes out when it's time to work, change the oil on the motorcycle. When it's time to fight the leaves like madmen, you know. When it's time to go camping, I carry stuff against me because you don't want to worry about that with that coat on. So you, again, which jacket gets used the most? Which one would I consider to be the nicest quality? Okay, ready? Hang on with me. We obsess or focus too much sometimes on having a belief like that. I want my belief to be of the highest quality. And what we do is we make that a one-time kind of belief. We would show up to Jesus and say, yeah, I believed in you, want, I believed in you. Yeah, there was a time when I took the leap. Oh, it was a great leap. I'm still in the air throughout my whole life. But that's not how faith or belief works, is it, everyone? It's not one high-quality leap. It's maybe a thousand leaps a day. Have you noticed that? But I focus all of, give me a greater faith. I want a bigger faith. I want a smarter faith. I want a wiser faith. I want a, this kind of faith, a high-quality faith. Give me more faith. Instead of focusing on something else, another quality of belief, what might be the other quality? Instead of a big, smart, fancy, high quality, finally have that belief I've always wanted, instead have a steadfast, durable, enduring. Jesus would rather me have a belief that I could use every single day than a big quality high fancy belief that only comes out every now and again. Maybe it only came out when I was six years old and first came to Christ. Is that leap of faith important, everyone? Yes. And somebody say, oh, you got a lot more leaping to do, brother. A lot more leaping. And that was a big leap. And for some people, it seems bigger than other people. But you got leaps to take in this life that you are not ready for right now but they're coming. How in the world, how in the world could I ever focus on this? You mean it's not about quality. It's not all about quality. Quality is, it's not all about quality. It's also very much about utility. Show me that you've got one big fancy tool, guys, in your garage that costs you so much that you use like once every six years. Then you've got this other tool that is your go-to. You use it all the time. Jesus says, when you think, I, when you think of belief, think of that tool. 
Think of the one that gets used all the time. Because disciples, you think you have, finally have one big academic fancy belief, finally. But a time is coming when you're going to need a thousand different little leaps of faith every single day. In that way, your belief is about to be tested in a thousand different ways. That's the two jackets. You guys can come up with something much better this week, tool or something that you use. I want us to do something right now, though. Would you take out those three-by-five cards? Class participation today. And I want to get you to be creative or just really honest and write down uh, three tribulations. Don't put your name at the top. I know you, you right brain people already have your name and date at the top. Don't do that. Just put three real life tribulations down there. Some of them be, be specific if you want to. Maybe it's something just happened to you. I'm not going to, you are going to share these in a second, but not out loud. Don't get scared. Just write them down. Three tribulations of life, three troubles of life. Just jot those down really quick. It probably is kind of easy. Your brothers and sisters are counting on you. Make them good. Okay, who's done? Nobody, okay work a little bit longer. Uh, number one, pastor asked you to write tribulations down. That's a tribulation. Made me look at his old jacket. Confused me by that. How many are done now? Whew, okay. A third of you are. <laughs> the rest of the rest of you are like, boy, don't get me started. If I see you flip the card over and you're still writing, I want you to stop. Just stop. We just need three tribulations. Okay. Now, now you're going to have to help me. You guys are going to have to help me with this one. Uh, everybody hand it to the person on the right of you. If you're at the end of the row, you've got to do some moving all the way to the other side of the church. Hand it to somebody else. Right? Everybody hand it. One person to the right. Just one to the right. Just one to the right. All right. Are you done with that? All right. You got to get up and move. Make this happen. That's just one person on the right. Don't keep passing it. Just pass it once. All right. Your card. Pass your card to the right. Your three by five card tribulations to the person to the right of you. Okay. Now, everybody have a three-by-five card full of tribulations? Everybody look at the person to your left, say, thank you for the tribulations. Okay, is everybody, follow, everybody tracking so far? Okay. Now hand it to the person behind you. One person behind you. The people in the back, got to bring it to the front. Everybody needs a card. Okay, everybody got a card still? You need a card for this exercise. Oh, the poor people on the front didn't have any faithful ones to bring them cards. So come on, everybody, share. You don't want two cards full of tribulations. You only want one card. That's enough, right? Okay, raise your hand if you do not have a card. Oh, oh my goodness. All right, everybody, keep your hands up if you don't have a card. Make sure these people have a card that's not there. Ready, set, go. Right, if you have two cards right now, give it to one of these people holding, the, holding their hand up. Okay. There you go. Okay. All right, ready? Now, looking at your card of tribulations... Here's what we're going to do. This is, the, this is the tricky bit. Think about the, the tribulation. Think about yourself going through that tribulation. And you know what happens when we go through tribulations. 
we lose our minds. We blame God first. We just go crazy. We blame God, and we start blaming everybody around us. We have these defensive mechanisms that kick in. We try to attack people who are on our team. You know, all these, we just lose our minds. So think about the tribulation. Try to, if you can, imagine yourself being pretty rattled by it. And then ask yourself this key question, which you might want to jot down. What do I believe right now? Let me give you a second to do that. Think of the tribulation. Think of the craziness you might be tempted to go through. And then ask this question of yourself in that situation. What do I believe right now? Not what did you believe when you were six. Not what did you believe when you were having a mountaintop experience at a tent revival. What do you believe right now about that thing? And let me clarify. For those of you new to all this, this is not I'm making up a belief. This is not I believe somewhere unicorns exist and the sun will come out tomorrow and all my hopes will come true. That's not what we mean. By belief, we mean what do you believe about Scripture that Scripture says that Jesus taught us? What do you believe about Jesus right now? Let's see if you can apply it to that tri tribulation. See if you can do that. Let me give you a second to do that. Okay, how did that go? Belief, real belief, is designed to impact our attitudes. What you just did, do that a thousand different ways every single day. Every single time your belief is tested, what happens is your belief starts turning into real action because faith without works is dead turning our intellectual belief into something that comes out of us even out of our attitudes so let me give an example uh, give me a tribulation De death of a loved one tribulation has happened you thought you could imagine how you would react. <laughs> because you always imagine how everybody else should have reacted. But then you go through it. And everything gets tossed up for grabs. But then the Holy Spirit gets in your face and makes eye contact. And says, what do you believe right now? And you want to look away. No, no, no. What do you believe right now? I believe that my loved one knew Christ. Yes. I believe that he was telling the truth about the heavenly country. Yes. It doesn't feel like that, but that's what I believe. Press me to it. That's what I believe. And I believe... I will spend so much time in the heavenly country that this will seem like a blip. I believe that the shepherd is walking with me through the valley of the shadow of death. I believe that right now. Believe, what do I believe right now? Another tribulation. One more tribulation. L loss of a job. I don't know what I'm going to do. How am I going to provide for my family? I feel like such an idiot. I hate myself. And the Spirit gets in your face. What do, what do you believe right now? Not 10 days ago when you weren't in chaos. Not, five, not 10 years ago when you had plenty of money. Right now. I believe that he's always provided for my needs and God will provide for them again. I believe that he's heard my prayers. Yes, I believe Scripture tells me I've got a church family that will take care of me. I believe. What do you believe 
right now. Then it begins to impact my attitudes. Some kind of strange peace comes out. Maybe even a kind of joy starts to come out. Right? Does everybody see this little practice? When your kids were little, moms and dads, one of the things you did was you didn't just shepherd their actions, you shepherd their hearts. So when your child threw a fit, remember, you don't just leave them on the floor to throw a fit. Right? We don't do that. It's awful for the child and the other customers in the store, right? You just allow them to continue. To, that's not what we do. Remember, moms and dads? We would get their attention. Well, sometimes we speak to them up here as they're running through the room, right? That's, that never works. We get their attention by... And we say to them, we, we, they're pretty upset. But we're like, you dropped your ice cream cone. No, I'm not going to buy you another one. Yes, I ate mine already. So <laughs> life's like that. <laughs> But what you tell them is, stop. You may not throw fit about this. And you make them stop. Remember moms and dads? You make them stop. And they can stop. But there's no one to do that for adults. <laughs> is there? <laughs> and how many of you would say, oh, I don't want to admit it. But there's been a lot of times when I needed somebody to get in my face and say, stop, fix your face. <laughs> Aren't you glad that's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit? Stop, Trey, stop. What do you believe right now? Because what you're doing is you're acting out your doubt. You're acting out your skepticism and it's, it's a sickness for you, or it's a sickness for everybody else around you. Instead, act out your belief. And so you might add this prayer to it. I'll give you a second. I'll just get you to write this down, but this prayer. Father God, please help me to apply what faith I have to my attitudes in a thousand different ways every day. Whew. Whoa. Because you're going to need it. That's what Jesus is saying to his apostles. You're going to need it. Father God, help me to apply what faith I have. It may not be the nicest quality faith, but it's the faith I can use every day. It's durable. It's useful. It has stood the test of time. I know what it's able to do. Father God, help me to apply this jacket faith, the kind of faith that's useful every day, directly to my attitudes. When I'm being grumpy towards everyone else, the Spirit gets in my face, say, what do you believe right now? I believe that God loves them. And I believe he sent his son Jesus to die for them, and I can love them. Right? When I'm worried constantly, I can't focus on anything else, I use my faith. It's utilitarian. I can use it. Father God, please help me to apply what faith I have to my attitudes in a thousand different ways every single day. So that's what Jesus is warning his apostles is coming. They don't realize any of this yet, but they'll write about it later. Would you guys say that little prayer with me? Father God, please help me to apply what faith I have to my attitudes in a thousand different ways every day. Stop obsessing over having the nicest quality faith. Instead, obsess over making use of the faith that you do have. Because even if it's the size of a mustard seed, if you can use it all over the place, that's a good faith to have. Right, everyone? Jesus looked at his apostles and said, Oh, you have little faith. And they were like, Well, it was kind of stormy. Would it be better for you to have the kind of faith that works even in a storm? Right? Because even if it's a small amount, that's better kind of faith because it's more useful. So let's see how we can finish up this departure journal entry for today because you already, you already started a writing, um, an entry entitled My Belief. Ooh, so let's see if we can finish this and uh, we'll pray together. I'm leaving, but I want you to know 
that I believe. I talk about my belief in Christ, but I hope I've shown you my belief in Christ. I hope you've seen my belief every time I... Uh, do things I don't want to do or do not do naturally. Every time I taught you, every time I faced another day bearing trouble and stress, I'm leaving, but I want you to know that you must take the business of believing seriously. Let's spend some time praying over this last thing, everyone. Do we take our believing seriously? Let's take just a moment and speak to the Lord about this particular thing.